we're continuing um, our series called Confounding the Wise. What we're doing in this series, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and keep your place in Genesis chapter 1. It should be pretty easy. It's the first um, chapter of the Bible, first page of the Bible. But go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and let's just recap the point of our sermon series um, this morning. It's been a, a couple of weeks. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look down at verse number 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 27. The Bible says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So what we're talking about in this sermon series is we're looking at specific personalities, specific people, um, you know, modern day people usually that, that are, are considered wise to the world. They're considered, um, they're very popular, many of them. We looked at, you know, Jordan Peterson was the first one. They're very popular. People can consider them very smart and intelligent and full of wisdom. And we're showing you that in the light of the Bible, these people, because of their lack of belief in God, that God has actually confounded them. And the more you learn about the Bible and the more you understand about the Word of God, these people would just seem more and more confused confused to you as a Bible-believing Christian. So today, this morning, we're looking at um, Mikio Kaku. Now, these things um, that we're going to talk about this morning, we're going to talk about the origin of the universe, but about Mikio Kaku, he's, so we'll talk about many different um, uh, statements from people, but we're going to focus mainly on him. Who is he? He's an American theoretical physicist, okay? He's a professor at City College of New York. And he's, um, he's into, um, his main study is astrophysics. And I really like astrophysics um, myself. He's also, um, another one of his titles that he claims is a futurist, which is, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting um, job category. I actually searched indeed.com and I could not find a job out there for a futurist. And I called a couple companies and I said, hey, can I, um, can you hire me as a futurist? And they're like, what is a futurist? And it's like, well, I just make up a bunch of things that have nothing to do with anything that aren't going to happen. And no one wanted to hire me. So no, I didn't call companies. But the point is, he just comes up with, with theories about the future of things. So we'll look at some of those um, this morning. This is kind of like shooting fish in a barrel this morning. I'm just going just to go ahead and, and tell you. But he's also, um, you know, in fitting with our, our series, he's a very popular um, author. He's a very popular commentator. A lot of people are listening to this person, which is why we're talking about him this morning. He has books called um, The Physics of the Impossible. is a bestseller. The Physics of the Future is a bestseller. The Future of the Mind is also a bestseller. And his latest book in 2021 was The God Equation, The Quest for a Theory of Everything. Well, guess what? I'm going to show you what the theory of everything is this morning. Um, but he's very, very popular, and he's heavily focused on the field of astrophysics, which is the study is the study of the galaxies. It's the study of, of the... It's basically you attach physics to the movement of the universe, and that is astrophysics. So let's first focus, as we've started out with every one of our personalities, let's first focus on what Mikio Kaku's um, thoughts and theory is on God, okay? First of all, quote, he says this about God. First of all, he's not an atheist, so I'll give him credit for that, and I've said this before in this sermon series, that there's very, when you actually start talking to people, there's very few atheists out there. Most people are agnostic. If you have somebody that's not, uh, super, I mean, an atheist, a true atheist is someone that is very filled with pride. Someone that can just say, I know that there is not a God. That is someone that thinks they know a lot of the knowledge pie. Someone that can just definitively say there's not a God. That is not Mikio Kaku. He's agnostic. He says, I don't know. Okay, let me give you a couple quotes. He says, there are only two types of God. When you talk about religion, I like to quote from Galileo. Galileo said, the purpose of science is to determine how the heavens go. The purpose of religion is to determine how to go to heaven. So in other words, science is about natural law. It's about the laws of nature. While religion is about ethics, about how to go to heaven, how to be a good person, how to earn the favor of God. 
So right there, he doesn't understand the gospel, obviously, even though he doesn't believe in God um, definitively. He clearly misunderstands um, the Bible's definition of going to heaven, okay, which is not um, surprising. But then he says this. So he says that science is the study of, you know, how the heavens and the universes and, and physic, the physical world works. And then he says God is just basically it's about ethics, how to act, how to treat each other is what he's saying. And he says as long as you don't combine the two, Mikio Kaku says, there's no problem at all. So you see, as long as you keep these two separate, there is no problem at all. The problem occurs when people from the natural sciences begin to pontificate about ethics and when religious people begin to pontificate about natural law, that's where we get into trouble. Now this is where, you know, he first goes wrong, right here. And he says, now he says, as far as the existence of God, you know, can you prove the existence of God? He says, you cannot. Therefore, you ask the question, is the existence of God provable? Well, what is science? Science is based on things that are testable, reproducible, and falsifiable. But you see, the existence of God is not testable. It's not reproducible. You cannot reproduce God at will. You cannot put an angel inside a box and demand that miracles take place. It doesn't work that way. That's why religion is based on faith rather than things that are objectively testable, falsifiable, and reproducible. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. I don't know. I don't know if God exists or not. All I'm saying is that science is limited by looking at what is testable, reproducible, and falsifiable. But then, as far as who or what created the universe, his, his answer is you have to either choose God or you have to choose some scientific theory out there. And what we're going to focus on is his theory of how the universe was created. So he believes in what is called the Big Bang Theory. I'm sure most people have heard of the Big Bang Theory. And now, personally, the Big Bang Theory, when I was in high school, when I was even in elementary school and middle school, it was just one of the theories out there. And it was considered, first of all, it was considered a theory when I was in high school. And second of all, it was laughable to everyone that heard it in high school. It was something that we all heard the teacher teach this out of the science book, and we thought it was, I mean, most of us were church kids, and I get that, but most of us, we thought, we looked at this theory, and we just, we thought it was the silliest thing that you've ever heard when I was in high school. But now, today, it's just accepted as fact, this Big Bang Theory. And this is what Mikio Kaku believes. So the theory is basically this. Let me explain the theory to you, and I'm going to spend some time um, using his um, illustrations to try to, because I want to, I want to help you understand what he believes, and then we'll look at what the Bible says. Okay. So the idea behind the Big Bang theory is that everything, all mass, all energy, was in what is called the singularity at the beginning, before time. He would say. The Big Bang theory states that the universe began as a hot and infinitely dense point. Only a few millimeters wide, it was similar to a supercharged black hole. About 13.7 billion years ago, this tiny singularity violently exploded. And it is from this explosion, this bang, that all matter, energy, space, and time were created. And he says that this, you know, while you can't produce, reproduce the Big Bang, he does say you can't test the Big Bang. He, he admits that. He says that you can see evidence for it versus that there is no evidence for God. You cannot reproduce the Big Bang. You cannot test the Big Bang. It's like a detective story. You can only look at the clues, the clues left over from the Big Bang. So to calculate the instant of creation is in some sense outside science because it's not reproducible. You cannot reproduce the Big Bang. But you can then trace the history of what happened afterwards like a murder mystery and that's where a lot of science is done. I'm going to prove this wrong to you this morning. Okay, let's see if what he says about the origin of the universe, let's look at the evidence. Okay, the evidence is this. Now, the Big Bang, 
The main evidence for the Big Bang, you say, what kind of evidence could be out there that could prove that everything was smashed into this tiny dot and then exploded into what we see today, including us, by the way, you know, billions of years later, of course. But it all comes from a single observation, and it's this, okay? From our galaxy, from the Earth, and I don't want to get geocentric on you this morning, so I'll just say from our galaxy, from our solar system, Everything that we look at in every direction is moving away from us at 70 kilometers per second. That can, that can be shown. Measurements of light. I love measurements of light. They can actually show that other galaxies are moving away from us at 70 kilometers per second. That is the evidence that they use. So every single direction, you know, in a 3D space that we look, other galaxies are moving away from us at 70 kilometers per second. Miki Kaku says this about the Big Bang. He says, as far as we understand it, it was not an explosion like a regular explosion at all. It was an explosion of space, not an explosion in space. According to the standard models, there was no space and time before the Big Bang. There was not even a before to speak of. So the Big Bang was very different from any explosion we were accustomed to and does not need to have a central point. You see, they have to argue against the central point because one would say if you're in a solar system and you look in every direction and everything is moving away from you at the same speed in every direction, what does that tell you about where you stand in that situation? You are in a unique place as things always explode out, do they not? But scientists can't admit that today. So he tries to explain, he tries to explain that it wasn't like any other explosion, that it's not like any explosion that you can imagine in your mind. So he's basically asking you right there to suspend logic and reason. And you have to just exit at that point. You have to dis, you know, he's asking you to dismiss the fact that it just doesn't make sense as something that you just don't understand. Sounds like a lot of Bible doctrines out there where people just have to ask you, you know, it just becomes so complicated, you know, you just can't understand it. Look, if someone tells you something in the Bible that you just can't understand, it's so complicated and they're trying to teach you doctrine that way, you got to exit that doctrine right there. But look at what the Bible says that there was before. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. Go back to Genesis chapter 1. So he says it wasn't like, he, he caveats the Big Bang. It's, it's not like an explosion that you can just imagine in your mind. Okay, this little dot, it exploded, but it's not like a regular explosion. So he puts that in there at first. But let's look at what the Bible says was there before, or how things became, before life anyway. Look at verse number 1. In the beginning God created the heaven, and the earth. So there we go. God, that first verse, God created the heaven and the earth. So there's the earth now. Look at verse number two, though. And the earth was without form and void and dark. So this is before life. This is before life in verse number two. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. So what existed before life? There was water before life. This is super interesting, and this is why I believe, personally, that water is so amazing. This is why I believe that, you know, we should just, like, as scientists and engineers, we should just, like, study water. That's all we should do. I've mentioned this before, but I have a book that's a thousand pages long. It's called Steam. It's all about water. We still have not figured out, think about this, just water, something that we use and see every day, we still have not figured out all the intricacies and the miracles of this fluid. And it was the first thing, other than God, we'll get to that in a minute, that existed before life came to the earth. We'll never probably figure out everything about water. It's such a miracle. But let's go back to, let's go back to the Big Bang. Now, this is how Miki Yukaku explains the Big Bang. He says, it's, uh, and I'm going to try to show you with a couple object lessons. He tries to explain the, the explosion and how we fit into the explosion of the Big Bang, he, he kind of explains it with a, a soap bubble. And then what is the universe expanding into? Well, if the universe is a sphere of some sort, and we live on the skin of the sphere, and the sphere is expanding, what is a sphere expanding into? Well, obviously, a bubble, a balloon, expands into the third dimension, even though the people living on the balloon are two-dimensional. So when our universe expands, what does it expand into? Hyperspace. So what I did is I have a balloon here, and I just painted some dots 
on the balloon. And so I'm going to blow this balloon up and kind of explain, you know, I'm going to show you physically some of the problems with this soap bubble theory, that we're just in this soap bubble just expanding throughout the universe. So let me blow this balloon up. Right away we can see some problems here, is that not only is the balloon expanding, but the dots are expanding too. So that's not a good analogy. And some scientists look at Mikio Kaku's analogy of the soap bubble and they're like, yeah, that's not really a good analogy. First of all, that's not really a 3D space. It's more like a curved 2D space. We obviously live in a 3D world. So he's not even really understanding dimensions properly since you know, we know we can look at the stars and the moon and the sun and the solar systems and the galaxies and we're clearly living in a 3D environment. And the dots got bigger. So as everything moves apart and all mass expands, is the Earth expanding? Are we expanding? Maybe I'm really expanding at 70 kilometers per second, and just everything around me is expanding at 70 kilometers per second as well, so I just don't notice, right? Look, I, it's funny. The kids are laughing. It is funny. It's ridiculous, right? I'm expanding, but hopefully not that fast. I'm trying not to expand as I get older. But the point is, the point is the balloon example doesn't fit. So you can go out and you can find some scientists that use a better analogy. And this is a better analogy. And they use an analogy of a loaf of raisin bread. So I have a loaf of raisin bread here. So I'm trying to uh, explain to you the universe here. So I have a loaf of raisin bread. I couldn't find a full one, but we've got one that's all cut up into slices. So here's the idea with this loaf of raisin bread. This is the universe. And as you bake the raisin bread, the, the bread, what? When you bake things, it expands, right? The bread expands, things get further apart. This is the best analogy I have heard of the Big Bang. The only problem is this. There's raisins in there, right? Why you would make anything with raisins is beyond me. But there's raisins in there. For, for the, the example of the universe, there's raisins in here. As this expands, the raisins don't expand. The raisins aren't expanding in this. But what they would call the bread, what they call the, what astrophysicists call the bread is the dark matter. Okay, the dark matter of the universe. You say, what? What in the world is dark matter? Well, no one knows what dark matter is. Now, we know dark matter exists. Dark matter is invisible. So if I held it in my hand, you wouldn't see it. In fact, it would go right through my fingers, go right through the rock underneath my feet, and go all the way to China. It would reverse direction and come back from China all the way here to New York City and go back and forth. So dark matter has gravitational attraction, but it is invisible. And we are clueless as to what dark matter really is. Okay, dark matter is simply something that is a made up theory that they, astrophysicists believe that 85% of the entire universe is made up of dark matter, which is mass matter that you can't see. You just can't see it. They don't know what it's made of. They can't see it. They've never captured it. But it's the dark matter that's expanding. But why is only the dark matter expanding and not the raisins? Literally, nothing that we can actually see, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, none of those things are expanding. As a matter of fact, did you know that if we were actually, I mean, that even the distances between these things, the distance between the sun and the earth is pretty much exactly the same to a point of a few centimeters every single year. Meaning it's like measurement error. Did you know that if we were moving away from the sun at the speed that they say the universe is expanding, we would all be dead in 21 seconds? I mean, think about it. We are at such a, an exact point as far as our location from the sun that it's ridiculous. So my point is that, you know, these guys can't even understand the reality that we live in correctly. The soap bubble, it's ridiculous. It's not even the right dimensions. Uh, you know, raisin bread analogy. I mean, what good is the raisin bread analogy of the universe from what I just showed you? You know? That's about it. You know, there's no, there's no point. It doesn't make any sense at all. So, at this point, there's two main starters, two main non-starters of the Big Bang where we have to just suspend all reality. The first one, as I told you, is that all mass on Earth was compressed into a tiny little dot. Okay, now look. 
testable, provable, reproducible. There's not a machine on the planet that can compress this pulpit into a tiny dot. And we're supposed to believe that the pressures and the temperatures that would be required to do something like that are possible? You have to suspend, oh, they say, you know what the pressure was? You know what the pressures and the temperatures were? They say infinity. I'm like, oh! <laughs> See, you're talking to an engineer here. This isn't, this isn't right. I can't just say, well, you know, let's build the strongest bridge ever. Which, how, how strong should we make it? Infinity. Look, I'd be fired in five seconds. So the point is, it, none of it makes any sense. They're compressed into a tiny little dot. It's ridiculous. It can't be proven. It can't be reproduced. It can't be tested. The second one is the universe as we observe it cannot be explained by an explosion. Period. Where all mass is expanding, where all fake virtual mass that no one has ever proven existed is expanding except the mass we can see. It doesn't make any sense. And not even all masses are, you know, rel I mean, like there's this explosion that happened and there's a, that like our solar system just like is, is moving together in that explosion and not moving. It's ridiculous. It, it's not, there's never been any possible explosion that can reproduce that at all. All right. So nothing that we can see or observe, we, you know, we have to, you have to suspend logic and reason to believe this is what I'm trying to get. So. This is why, by the way, that the Big Bang Theory and you know, evolution theories, this is why most things that you see about them, you will just have artistic renditions of things. You will have paintings, you will have um, you know, graphical designers you know, doing things because it has nothing to do with observable or testable reality. And the singularity itself, you know, it, it, it's not observable, it's not testable. The theories on dark matter, they're completely unproven. They just, they look at the universe and how it moves, and they can't explain it, so they come up with this mystical mass that explains how the universe is, is in motion, is what, where dark matter came from. This is, you know, this goes into theories about black holes and all these types of things, which goes into theories about wormholes and being able to control time. I've, I've preached a whole sermon on controlling time, um, look into that, but the first point is, is that the fact that all the galaxies are moving away from us, no matter what direction we look, the only significant conclusion I can come to with that is that we occupy a, an important place in the universe. It's amazing when you think about it that way. But it makes for good topics and good, you know, conversation and people will, um, you know, put you on TV to talk about these things. But the irony the irony is that, you know, we occupy a significant space, but instead, you know, they will go into, instead of, a, you know, a logical person coming to that conclusion, they'll go into wild theories about raisin cake and soap bubbles and, and all this, this godless talk about states of matter and things that aren't possible, okay? It's completely confounded. So. Evolution theory teaches 20 billion years ago, or sometime in the past like that, there was a big bang where nothing exploded. And then 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. And then it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. This is what the books teach, okay? That's the big bang theory. 18 or 20 billion years ago, big bang. 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. Earth, planet Earth cooled and a rocky surface was created. This is what all the textbooks teach, okay? Then as the Earth formed, it was hot and it was large pools of bubbling lava, but it slowly cooled down. And then, boys and girls, millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> sure is. It don't even happen. That's how slow it is. This guy said the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. So their theory would say 20 billion years ago, Big Bang, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, it rained on the rocks for millions of years, turned them into soup, and the soup came alive 3 billion years ago. And so there's Grandpa right there. Okay. <laughs> now. So let's look at the Bible narrative. All right, go back to Genesis chapter 1. And let's look at... Hopefully, I, I tried to give you kind of an overview there uh, of, of the ridiculousness of it, how confounded um, this Big Bang Theory is. And of course, you know, the Big Bang Theory created life as well. And then, you know, life evolved into us, right? 
So um, I tried to really break that down into like a seven minute um, explanation. But now let's look at what the Bible says and let's see what is easier to believe. Okay, let's look at what the Bible says. Look at Genesis chapter one. Let's look at some science in the Bible here. The point is, is that when Mickey Okaku says, I want to show you this morning, when Mickey Okaku says that as long as you don't mix religion with science, you're fine. The point is that science and religion have to be mixed or you become confounded. This is what I'm trying to point out to you this morning, and hopefully I can prove that to you. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Now look at verse number 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And there was two things there. Okay, there was two things there. God created the heaven and the earth, but when the earth was there and it was without form, there was two things that were present. The first one, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There was the Spirit of God and there was the water. Okay, now turn to John chapter 1, because there was something else there too. There was something else that was present. Turn to John chapter 1. So we see in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 2 that we had the Spirit of God and we had the water. Okay, this is after God created the earth, before God created life. Okay, so there's no life at this point. So where did life come from? You know, where did life come from? Well, first of all, there's no theory out there, explosions, evolution, anything that can tell you where life started from, except this one. They can tell you all kinds of wild things about things blowing up and moving around and dark matter and wormholes and black holes and all this stuff. They can't tell you how life got created. They can't tell you how that first life started. But look, look at the beginning. In verse number two, we had water and we had the Spirit of God. But look at John 1. There was something else there. So we know that God was there. and We know God has how many parts? God has three parts. So if God was there, the Spirit of God was there, and also the Word of God was there. Look at verse number one of John chapter one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Made by who? Made by the Word. All right? In John chapter 1, 14, it says the Word became flesh. We're talking about Jesus Christ here. We're talking about Jesus before he was manifest in the flesh. We're talking about the Word of God, and things were made by the Word of God. Amen. So here you had an earth that was without form, and then you had the Word of God on top of that with water. So you had a formless earth, water, and we had God. Now, does this make sense in the physical world? Let's look at this. Let's look at this. In, look, I preached a whole sermon on how the universe works as well. I was talking about the second law of thermodynamics. Everything moves to disorder all the time. Unless energy is added, things just move to disorder. If you don't add energy to your body, you will be dust. If you don't eat, if you don't drink water, you will be dust eventually because everything moves to disorder all the time. If you sit your car out in the middle of the field, eventually that car will rust, it will rot, it will become dirt because everything needs energy added to it to become orderly. So here we had the earth. It was without form. Things don't just get orderly on accident. Physics tells us this. Energy must be added in order to create order. So look at, um, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. We need energy. And what did we have? What did we have? We had water and we had the Word of God. But we need energy. So where's that energy coming from? Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12 says this, For the Word of God is quick and what? And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing, look, I like power. I mean like energy power. And the Bible says that the word of God is powerful. And you're like, man, that's talking about spiritual power. Yeah, that's true. But look, let's read. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And what? To the joints and marrow. And as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. There's your energy, folks. Yes, it's spiritual, but joints and marrow, marrow that's physical. The word of God is spiritual. The Word of God, yes, you will get saved through the Word of God. The Word of God will change your spirit. You'll be sealed by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. But the Word of God has physical power, is what the Bible is saying. And that 
is your energy. And where did the life come from? Look at John chapter 1 and verse 4. In him was life. Look, life can come from nowhere else. Show me where else in the world, in, in any test, in any experiment, in anything, that anyone has created life. It is God that contains life. It is God. So we had the Word, we had energy, and we had God. Those three things put together, that's how the earth, then you read the rest of Genesis 1, that's how he did it. That's how he created that order, through the power of the Word of God. It matches, it matches physics today. It matches perfectly. And guess what? Here's another funny one. What does all life need? What's the only thing? What's the only thing, only substance that every single living, hu not human, every single living organism needs on the planet that we know of? Water. Doesn't need light. Some organisms don't even need air. They found organisms two miles deep in the ocean. But every living organism needs water. It's beautiful. And guess what, folks? It is science in the Bible right there. That's God not only, look, God could have wrote in the Bible, I created everything. But he tells us how he did it. And then we have scientists, these, these confounded fools that everyone thinks is wise, telling us you can't combine science and the Bible. Look, the Bible is science. The Bible is the truth. It's the only truth that makes any sense. Look, no one can make life. Look, we can copy it. We can take a cell and, you know, implant it in another embryo and make, we can, we can play with it. We can toy with it. We can modify it. We can't create it. We can't create it. That only comes from God. And there is no other theory out there, including the Big Bang, that can explain where life came from. You should go and do this experiment. You should go and blow things up for the rest of your life and see how many times you create a living organism. Don't we see the opposite, by the way? Whenever things are getting exploded, whenever things are blowing up, aren't things dying, usually? Unfortunately. But look, it's all right there in the Bible. That's what I'm trying to say. So you have to ask yourself, what makes more sense? What makes more sense? But guess what? There's more. God says there's, there's evidence. Go to Romans chapter 1. God says, God says, hey, I told you how I did it. I told you, here's the water. Here's the earth without form. Here's God. Here's the power of the word. And this is how I did it. It matches the laws of thermodynamics that we know today, that we've learned today. But God says there's more. He says there's evidence. And every man has this evidence. Look at Romans chapter 1. I mean, look, I remember we went to the Creation Museum many, many years ago. And my favorite room in the Creation Museum was the, I mean, there was all the dinosaurs and all the different things like that that the kids love. My favorite room was the bugs, the beetles. Because there's, it was such great evidence of God. We went into this room and there's just these, just hundreds of beetles, these big beetles and bugs on these tag, you know, they got them all pinned in these, these display cases. And it's just these beautiful patterns. It's just these beautiful artistic patterns. You know what's bad camouflage in, in nature? Right angles. <laughs> Straight lines. You know, this isn't camouflage. This is just an artist having a good time. You ever seen a sand dollar? I was going to bring one today. A sand dollar is this cool little thing you get at Pismo Beach. It's in the ocean. And it's this neat little organism. It's got holes and it's got this neat little design. It's like an airplane wing and all this. But on the back or on the top of a sand dollar is just this beautiful little pattern that has nothing to do with how that sand dollar lives. It has nothing, it's just this beautiful flower pattern. It's just an artist showing you his artwork is what that is. There's no other reason for it. Look at um, Romans chapter 1. Are you there? Romans chapter 1. Let me go there. Romans chapter 1. The Bible says, the Bible says because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. How did, I mean, God's saying there's, there's evidence. There's evidence of what I'm saying to you on how I created the universe. And he says, he says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. He's saying, look, if you can't look around at the beetles, at the bugs, at the sand dollar, at the galaxies, at the universes, and he's like, I'm showing you. I'm showing you that what my word says is true is what God 
is saying. Even, even the heavens, even the heavens are evidence. Look, the Bible goes into astrology. The Bible tells us all about, it explains the reasons for the stars and the suns and the moon and the planets. And it's not, look, it doesn't mention dark matter and, and wormholes. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. God is telling you, look, I gave you this creation. I gave you this creation to look at, and this is proof of me. This is proof of my what? Of my power. Of the power that it must have taken to build that. Look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. Look, God even tells us, God even tells us why he created the heavens and the stars and the planets and the solar system. He tells us why. Look at verse 14. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night. And so there's the first reason. So we can have day and night. He says, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And so it was so. Notice how he's speaking it into existence with the power of his word. His word has, has, your word doesn't have power. My word doesn't have power unless I'm speaking the word of God. God's word has actual spiritual and physical power. That's why he's speaking it into existence. And God made two great lights, verse 16. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night. And he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. So what does he say he, he did this for? For signs, for seasons, for days, for years. First of all, it's a clock. Right. It's a clock. Do you know that as smart as we are, we're so smart, we have so much technology, you know we can't even make a clock that can match God's clock? Even the, even the most accurate atomic cesium clock today has to be adjusted to solar time every single year because it's always off a little bit. Because God's time is so accurate, we can't even match it. We can't even match how precise his clock is. So that's the first thing, it's a clock. And then seasons. And look, here's another thing, and seasons and days and years, so we can keep track of time. Of time, it's a clock for us. And the second thing is for science, you know, it's a tool. It's a tool that God uses to show us things. Look, we'll see tonight, turn to Isaiah chapter 13. We'll go into this tonight in very great detail in the Bible, but God uses the heavens and the stars and the planets to communicate with us, to show us things that are going to happen. Look at Isaiah 13, 10. The Bible says, I mean, he marks events using this tool. He's going to mark events for us. Look at Isaiah 13 and verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. This is a marking point for us right here. That God is using the heavens, the moon, and the sun. He's going to use this to show us a very specific event that we'll look at this evening. He's using this as a way to show us what's going to happen in conjunction with his words. Mark 13, 25, I'll just read to you. And the stars of heaven shall fall. And the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. I think we'll notice that. Don't you? I think we'll notice that happening. Turn to Psalm chapter 19. So God uses, he, he tells us why he built these things. It's, it's, it's so we can see his creation and we can see his power. It's a clock for us. It's the seasons for us. It's day and night for us. It is, it is a tool for him to show us prophetic events that are going to happen in this world. Okay, but again, look at Psalm chapter 19 and verse number 1. Again, just showing why God built this universe. Because he could have just built the earth. But why did he build the universe around us? Look what he says in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. He's like, that is proof. That's what he's saying. He's like, the, the heavens declare He's like, the heavens show you. You should look at those things. Look, you should look at these. I mean, how many of you have seen pictures of the, the whole Hubble tel Space Telescope? It's amazing. Yeah. We should look at the Hubble Space Telescope and look at these amazing far-out galaxies and these amazing nebulas and these things that, quite frankly, we don't even know what they are. And we should just look at that and just be like, whoa. Yeah. That should invoke fear of the Creator to us. 
That should invoke, you know, somebody that had, the, that should show us the power of the Word of God that created that. I mean, I mean, and look, that, that should make people tremble. That should make people tremble. That should drive people to the Lord. That should drive people to the truth of the Bible. But instead, we have the scientists that deny all this, that deny God. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27, God says he's just going to confound those people. So is Mickey Okaku confounded? I mean, this is pretty, what I've, what I've just shown you is just a snippet in the Bible of how amazing, you know, the Word of God is, how amazing the story of creation is in the Bible, how amazing the Lord is. But look, these people that deny that power, and they deny that, start saying things like, we live on a giant soap bubble. We physicists believe that our universe is like a soap bubble. Mm -hmm. We live on the skin of the soap bubble. We're like flies trapped on flypaper. We can't get off our soap bubble. Mm -hmm. But it's expanding. In fact, it's actually accelerating. We can mm -hmm. actually see the end. <laughs> well, we physicists now believe there are other soap bubbles out there. Mm -hmm. There's no longer a universe. There's no yeah. longer a one world. Mm -hmm. There are many worlds. Right. There are other soap bubbles out there. And these soap bubbles are called membranes, or mm -hmm. brains for short. And they can collide. They can peel off, bud other universes. Mm -hmm. It's so confusing. But here's the thing. This Mickey Okaku, when you listen to him, he's very charismatic. A lot of people listen to this guy. He's constantly quoting famous scientists like Woody Allen. And as that great philosopher of the Western world once said, Woody Allen, <laughs> he once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. Like uh, Mark Twain. You know, and, and just like all these pop culture figures, I'm just like, why are you bringing Woody Allen into a scientific, you know, discussion? He's obsessed, and you talk about God confounding people with foolish things, this guy is obsessed with aliens. He's obsessed with alien civilizations. A type one civilization is truly planetary. They absorb all the light coming in from their mother's star. And they control all planetary forms of energy. For example, they might be able to modify the weather. They may not be able to control earthquakes and volcanoes. That's type one. A type two civilization is stellar. They control the entire energy output of a star. Type three is galactic. They control the energy output of the entire galaxy. I mean, he literally has a video on the internet where he's telling people, like, advice on how to handle if they get abducted by aliens. I tell them that the next time you are kidnapped by an alien flying saucer, steal something. I don't care whether it's a pen, a chip, steal something, because there's no law against stealing from an extraterrestrial civilization. You're not gonna go to jail. We need to keep our presence secret because who knows what the aliens believe in. This is what he says. <laughs> Now, some people say that we should not try to make contact with them because they could be potentially dangerous. For the most part, I think they're going to be peaceful because they'll be thousands of years ahead of us, but we cannot take the chance. So I personally believe that we should not try to advertise our existence to alien life in outer space because of the fact that we don't know their intentions. In fact, if you read the novel War of the Worlds, the Martians in H.G. Wells' seminal novel were not evil in the sense they wanted to torture us and they wanted to do all sorts of barbaric things to humanity. No, we were just in the way. You know, he talks about, he talks about colonizing Mars. I'm like, okay, all right, maybe he's got some good engineering solutions here. We're going to colonize Mars. Not like that's a good idea. Mars is negative 100 degree Fahrenheit and the soil is poisonous. <laughs> it's like, good one. Let's, get, let's go there, you know? But he's like, what we need to do is send a bunch of self-replicating robots and, and have them build Mars into a planet Earth for us, even though there's no such thing as a self-replicating robot. I mean, he's just, it's, just, it's just stupidity. Romans 1.22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This is exactly what we're seeing with so many people today. Antarctica is minus 60 degrees. I mean, it's better. Let's go, let's go colonize Antarctica. It's a much better idea than colonizing Mars, all right? It's, it's closer, too. I mean, you don't have to get in a rocket and travel for, I don't know, 20 years or whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, it's like, any volunteers? So look, the point I'm trying to make is that 
that when people deny the power of the Lord, they deny God, God just confounds them and confuses them. All right, and he just brings them into foolishness. And your time, quite frankly, your time would be better spent listening to a plumber. Because then at, last, at least you'd learn something. You'd learn something about plumbing. I mean, other than this nonsense. But he's even, he's even delved into actual physical um, design of things and actual physical predictions of things that are actually being built. Let's look at this. So let me just bring this one up. Who's heard of the CERN Halon Collider? So in 2008, there was a $16 billion project that was finished, and, and it was this basically it was this big underground tube that was 16 miles in diameter. And it was built to smash particles at close to the speed of light into each other. All right, and Mickey Ukaku said that what's going to happen is we're going to create all these mini black holes everywhere. There's all kinds of, I don't know if you remember this, if you're a little bit older, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories on the internet that the CERN Halon Collider was going to create a black hole and the whole Earth and universe would be sucked into it and we're all going to die. I'm sure people were building bunkers somewhere for this. But the point is, he made a prediction on what would happen when this physical device was put into, into play. But look, none of that happened. None of his predictions came true. As a matter of fact, you know, what they came up with, you know, didn't create many black holes, which many people predicted, by the way, many black holes. And they, so they come up with, oh, the energy needed to produce a mini black hole is 40 times greater than what CERN can do. So we need a bigger CERN, you know, is what they said. But I, I stumbled across this quote about a man that left the, um, it, was a, it was an article written by a man that left the, the field of particle physics. And he left for these reasons. I just found this so interesting. And he's talking about CERN, but then he talks about, you know, particle physics in general. And let me just read this for you from this man. He's, he left the field. He says the stories about new particles, dark matter, and additional dimensions, these were all predictions that we were going to find with the CERN Halon Collider. They were repeated in countless media outlets from before the launch of the Halon Collider. What happened to those predictions? And he says, the simple answer is, because the thing's been in, in, it's been in, in operation now for several years. He says, those predictions were wrong. That much is clear. There's all these predictions from all these people were just completely wrong on an actual physical device. And then he says this, he says, the trouble is, a prediction in particle physics is today a little more than guesswork. In case you're wondering, yes, that's exactly why I left the field. In the past 30 years, particle physicists have produced thousands of theories whose mathematics they can design to predict pretty much anything. You can prove a lot of things with math, folks. For example, in 2015, when a statistical fluctuation in the LHC data, the Halon Collider data, looked like it might be a new particle, physicists produced more than 500 papers in eight months to explain what later turned out to be an error. It's just, it's all about academia just producing theories and producing, you know, um, it, it's, it's vainglory to a large degree. The same has happened many other times for similar, similar fluctuations, demonstrating how worthless those predictions are. So the truth is, folks, that the older the world gets, you know, the more that is discovered, the more science that is discovered, the Bible is just proven true again and again. That is the truth. I mean, from history to you know, archaeology, archaeology, through philosophy of rising and falling empires, the Bible predicts it all. The Bible is the theory of everything. And it is science combined with you know, your relationship with God. But God explains to you how the world works in the Bible, how the universe works, the purpose of it. Look, what he wants you to know, he explains to us in the Bible. So God you know, by his creation can be seen. And he's given us evidence. We, and we see that. The Big Bang and all these godless theories, folks, they just lead down a road, lead down a road of, of its absurdity. And nothing will ever come from it. Nothing physical will ever come from it. That's why I've explained to you before, Einstein invented nothing. There's no physical device out there that Einstein had anything to do with. Because it's all, it's all garbage. He was confounded just like these people. Turn to Psalm chapter 8. Psalm chapter 8. Nothing will ever come from it. Nothing will ever come from it. Psalm chapter 8, look at verse number 3. Psalm chapter 8, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, when I consider thy heavens, this is somebody who's pondering. This is somebody who's looking at that, 
that Hubble Space Telescope, you know, amazing image. He says, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, thou hast made. He said, what is man? That is the attitude right there. So when we look at these things, even us, we're saved believers. We, we know that we're going to heaven. We know if I drop, I know if I drop dead right now, that I will be in heaven in, in the blink of an eye. But when I look at the stars and the moons and the universes and the galaxies, I'm just like, what am I? And that is how we should look at this thing. Look, and I'm not saying that, you know, it doesn't take faith. There's not absolute proof of God. But here's the thing. It doesn't take blind faith. It doesn't take blind faith because there's plenty of evidence that God has given us. I mean, for by grace, are you saved through faith? Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. Turn to Hebrews chapter 1. So yeah, you know, we need to have faith. You need to have faith that the Bible is true in order to be saved. That is true. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So yes, it takes faith. But here's the thing. It doesn't take blind faith. And God does not expect you to shut off logic and reason because the Bible and everything that we see in the universe is explained thoroughly in the Bible that it, make, it makes sense to us. And that's why, you know, when you have to shut off logic and reason for any reason, you have to exit the building because you're listening to someone who's confounded themselves. Mikio Kaku, completely confounded. Let's bow our heads.